Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming June of 2017 regional auction. Today we're going to continue our look at the development of the Winchester Lever Action Rifles with the model of 1886. So when we last left off, we were looking at the model of 1876, which was the first time Winchester was actually able to chamber a full-size rifle cartridge in their lever action system. And it worked reasonably well, but it was about at the limit of what the locking system in that rifle family could actually handle. That toggle lock had stayed almost completely unchanged since the original 1860 Henrys, and there just wasn't a lot, a lot of space left in the design. So, we're going to switch gears for just a moment here. In 1883, uh, Bennett, the president of the Winchester Company at the time, uh, traveled to Utah to meet John Moses Browning. And the purpose of the trip was actually to secure the rights for Winchester to Browning's single-shot rifle design. Uh, this would become known as, or would become marketed as the model of 1885 single-shot rifle. It was a fantastically successful rifle for Winchester, and Winchester needed something in that role to fill the gap in the market that really had been left when the Sharps Rifle Company dissolved. Uh, anyway, that's, that's a kind of separate issue. That's why Winchester was visiting Browning. What they discovered when they got there was that Browning was also working on a big bore lever action rifle. And it was one that was much stronger, uh, the basic design was much stronger than the Winchester 1876. So uh, Winchester basically made a deal uh, on the spot that when the rifle was fully developed, they wanted to buy it. Now the standard practice at the time was for a company to offer an inventor a flat rate for uh, rights to their patent. And that's what Browning did with Winchester for like 20 years. Uh, with the 1885 single-shot rifle, uh, Winchester paid Browning $8,000 for all, all unlimited use of the patent, um, and exclusive unlimited use of the patent. So nobody else got to use it, just Winchester. Uh, they made the same deal with the model, what would become the model of 1886, except for more money. They paid Browning $50,000 for that patent and design, and that was a pretty impressive sum of money in those days, in the 1880s. And it was this sort of flat payments that made it possible for Browning and his family to be financially independent, and for him to just continue uh, tinkering with rifles and coming up with new designs and new ideas. Even his guns that never made it, or even his patent ideas that never became marketed guns, and there were a lot of those, Winchester bought those too, just to make sure that nobody else could get some excellent Winchester, excellent Browning design, and become a, a serious competitor against Winchester. Uh, they wanted first right of refusal on everything, they wanted to keep Browning as a steady designer exclusively for them, so they bought everything he made, whether they thought it was marketable or not. The heart of the 1886 is, of course, its locking system, and what Browning came up with was a system where he would have two vertically traveling locking lugs that would interface with both the bolt and the receiver. And that made for a much stronger system than just a knee joint toggle lock. So when we open the lever, you can see that these two bolts, one on each side, they're going to drop down. That means they come out of uh, connection to the bolt. You can actually see the half section where they would interface with the receiver there, the half section where they interface with the bolt. When the lever closes, those lugs come up and they securely hold the bolt in place. Browning also devised an improved elevator system. This was self-contained, no longer had an opening at the bottom of the receiver where foreign material could potentially get in. And the way this one worked was that a cartridge would come off, come out of the magazine tube onto this follower in the bottom, or this elevator, and the last bit of the bolt, or the lever throw, would lift the front of the elevator up. One of the other interesting elements is, you can actually see there that the bottom half of the bolt is protruding forward. That does a couple things. It's going to act as the ejector when the case, when the, the bolt is fully open, and that kicks out the empty case. It also acts as a safety, because it only retracts back to meet the rest of the bolt face when the bolt is fully closed. At that point the extractor is going to snap over the cartridge, now the bolt is fully locked, and only at this point does that extension retreat into the bolt face, 
which means that the firing pin uh, can now protrude through and fire the cartridge. Uh, the markings on these rifles uh, have finally made a change. They no longer have specific patent dates listed on them. Um, but these are still uh, manufactured by the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, New Haven, Connecticut. We will find caliber markings on the back of the barrels here. Uh, this particular one, it looks like someone has replaced the rear sight because the original uh, markings would not have been overlapped by the rear sight. The model designation is still on the upper tang, uh, model 18, 1886, and the serial number is on the lower tang. Now one of the complicated parts, or one of the seemingly complicated parts about these rifles, is this weird array of cartridges that were offered in them. So here we have a 4590 Winchester centerfire, but there were also this a whole bunch of, of new sounding cartridges, the 3856, the 3870, the 4065, the 4070, the 4082, the 4570, the 4590, the 5110, the 5100. Well, what's, what's the deal with all of these? The deal is that they are basically all adaptations of the 4570 cartridge case. Uh, Winchester took that basic case head and adapted it to a variety of bullet diameters, weights, and powder charges. And so while all of these different designations sound complicated, they're basically just uh, the same case, necked down to 38 or 40, or left at 45, and then with a lighter or heavier bullet, and a corresponding powder charge. So all of these things are basically firing projectiles at 13 to 1500 feet per second, and it's just a question of what diameter and what bullet weight do you want. That dictates what cartridge you're going to order. Uh, the, the two that are not related to 4570 are the, the 50 caliber cartridges, the 5100 and the 5110. Um, the 110 used a light bullet, I believe it was uh, 300 grain, and the 5100 used a much heavier 450 grain bullet. And they're the same length case, they only have a difference of 10 grains of powder in the charge. The reason they were actually made into two different cartridges was because the length of the bullet dictated that they would have slightly different twist rates to the rifling. So I think it was like 1 in 54 and 1 in 60. Other than that, the cartridges are basically interchangeable. But because they had different rifling twists, they were sold as different, they required differently made barrels, which meant that Winchester just designated them as different cartridges to prevent people from getting the two mixed up. So despite this wide array of nine different cartridges, what you're basically looking at is 4570 and developments thereof. The introduction of the 1886 here really pretty much destroyed market interest in the 1876. This was just a substantially better gun. It was, however, a more expensive gun, and so that's why uh, sales of the 76 did continue anyway, is because it was it did continue to be more affordable than, than this new model. But uh, being a more expensive rifle, there were certainly people out there who were willing to spend a lot of money on these, and so Winchester offered a wide variety of custom special features on them. One of the interesting ones that you'll sometimes find, especially on fancier rifles like this, is a takedown system. You can see here on the receiver that there is a gap or a seam, and then if we look at the front, the real giveaway for a takedown Winchester of this era is this lever on the magazine tube. So in order to take the rifle down, we're going to pry this lever out, and we are going to use it to unscrew the magazine tube. There we go. Once the magazine tube is fully unscrewed, I'm going to go back to the action. We're going to open the action just slightly to disconnect the, uh, to get the extractor out of the breech face, and then rotate the barrel about 90 degrees. Like that. And then the receiver and the barrel separate. The rationale for this was to make the rifle uh, more compact for transportation. Uh, you could then pop it in a nice, a much shorter little case uh, to get to wherever you're going to be hunting, whether it was across the Atlantic for a safari, or just down to the local shooting park. The mechanics of the takedown system are actually fairly simple. Uh, the magazine tube of course is threaded so that when it's uh, when the gun's put together, it's nice and solidly installed in the receiver, but by unscrewing it you can 
disconnect it, and then there is an interrupted thread on the barrel. So the barrel locks in with threads on the top and bottom, but they're cut smooth on the left and right, so a 90 degree rotation allows it to come uh, completely free and out of the gun. There's one other design feature that we can now see really well, because we have a receiver without the barrel in it. And that is this protruding section on the bottom half of the bolt face there. That is going to prevent the firing pin uh, from protruding far enough to actually fire a cartridge. You can see the firing pin just trying to come out there. Uh, but the firing pin can't hit the primer unless the gun is fully locked in battery. That's really important, especially as you get these larger and more powerful cartridges. So if we look at that from the top, you can see that it really sticks out a significant distance. That's like 3 millimeters. And then as the action closes, that lower portion is cammed down, basically flush with the rest of the bolt face. And once it is, then the firing pin can come forward enough to actually detonate a cartridge. However, I'm going to hold the firing pin as far forward as I can get. Even at this point, I think that's a little hard to see, but at this point the firing pin isn't protruding enough to fire a cartridge. And if we look at the position of the lever, it's almost closed, but not quite. It's actually partially in battery, but until that lever is all the way closed, the firing pin can't actually protrude enough to fire. So that was a very important and well-designed safety mechanism by Browning. We can also note that because this new bolt design fully encloses the action at the top, there's no longer a need for a sliding dust cover like on the 73 and 76 rifles. So a little bit of simplification there. The Kingsgate is pretty much the same, although now that they're using longer and longer cartridges, the original Kingsgate design was just a flexible piece of sheet metal, um, and that has been changed to a, an actual spring-loaded hinge pin. So the longer cartridges were getting to the point where it would be difficult to have a very durable uh, original style Kingsgate, so they kept the same mechanism, uh, but manufactured it in a little bit more robust way. So that 50 grand that Winchester paid for the rights to this design certainly paid off. Uh, between 1886 and 1932 or 35, they produced 160,000 of these rifles. Uh, they would then actually reintroduce it uh, in the late 30s as the Model 71. The 71 is pretty much a random number, has no relation to a date. Um, they made another 46,000 under the designation Model 71. Those were in production until the late 50s. So more than 200,000 of these rifles in total. Um, they would be very well liked by guys like Theodore Roosevelt, who would carry these on hunting expeditions. This truly was a rifle that, that could take down anything. Um, certainly in the larger 50 calibers, there, there was no need to have a bigger rifle, because this would do anything that you needed um, a serious hunting rifle to do. And, of course, as is typical of Winchester at this time, there was a huge variety of options that you could get. Sights, stocks, wood, configurations, barrel lengths, magazine lengths, you name it. And we actually have two... I tried to get two examples here that were pretty far apart. So we have a very standard plain carbine, straight stock, simple wood, no real frills to it, and a fairly short barrel, um, and that is in 4570. And then we have a much fancier sporting rifle here in 4590 with the, the fancy wood, the, the, the pistol grip, checkering, um, and in fact even, as you saw, a takedown model. So anything from the simple to the very ornate you could get. As usual, of course, both of these are coming up for sale here at Rock Island, as are a number of other 1886 Winchesters. I have links to the, the catalog pages for these two specific ones in the description text below. So if you're specifically interested in either of them, take a look at those links. If you'd like to browse the catalog, there are a bunch more 86s in there, so uh, take a look and see what you can find. If you uh, find something that you'd like to bid on, they have an easy setup for doing that through Rock Island's website. Thanks for watching, and make sure to tune back in. We'll be continuing this with the 1892, the next version of the Winchester lever action.